Hey guys, welcome back to the Ariam Institute of Awesomeness. We're back here with another fun, interesting video for you guys. I'm your host, Josiah Ariyama, and today I'm gonna to be talking about Emil Durkheim and conversations that don't help with making friends or trivia. So first of all, I wanna say that there is a lot of really good videos and educational content available on YouTube already, which is very high budget and polished, which go into a lot of Durkheim's ideas and his concepts. And you should probably go look at those videos if you're interested, um, cause I'm not gonna do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to talk more generally about the life of Emile Durkheim and why he is a significant figure in history, particularly in sociology. So Durkheim, Emile Durkheim was born David Emile Durkheim in, um, 1858 in Lorraine, France. Okay, and just fun fact, sidebar, Lorraine, France is in, I believe, the northeast of France. It's by the area called Champagne, which is where they make champagne, and it borders um, Belgium and Germany and another country. So it was, even at the time that um, Emile was born, it would have been like a very like multicultural, um, prosperous sort of area in France. The reason that he is significant to the field of uh, sociology and for history is because he is the architect of the scientific method. Or in one way you could think of him as being the first sociologist. There were other sociologists before him and especially a lot coming out around his time, but compared to people like say Karl Marx or W.E.B. Du Bois, their dissertations or their arguments were written a lot like sermons and there was a lot of observation happening. Um, it had a lot to do with economics, whereas Durkheim's later work and the method that he would pioneer was all based on a scientific method, specifically establishing research methods and finding a way to study society as an actual science and not just like a theory or a philosophy or an opinion. So he was born in 1858 and his family was a very observant Jewish family. He had two previous generations of his family that were rabbis and he had actually entered rabbinical school um, with the intent of carrying on the family tradition, but he dropped out of rabbinical school pretty quickly and had a completely secular life. However, even though he was probably an atheist and lived a completely secular life, he was a huge fan of religion, um, and I can explain why later. It'll make sense when we just like lightly dust on his theories. But although he was secular, he loved the Jewish community because he saw that they had a very important role. Not just the Jewish community, the Christian community, any organized religion he was a huge fan of, despite not being observant himself. So what he wanted to do was he wanted to study to go into the Grand Ecole. Um, I'm sure that that is, uh, my pronunciation is not fantabulous, but whatever, say dommage. That means that's too bad in French. <laughs> so um, it actually took him three tries to get into the Grand Ecole, and he was um, he got in at the age of 21. And it's the Grand Ecole is different than a, than a university, but it's very similar. So it doesn't really grant like a degree in so much as it gives you four years of training to be a civil servant. Most usually it would be to be a public school teacher or a lecturer at a university. Probably the most similar thing I could think of to compare it to would be West Point in um, America, which is like a military college where you go and it's like going to university to prepare you for um, professional service in the military. The Grand Ecole is like that in France, but it's for mostly just teachers and unfortunately for uh, Durkheim or fortunately it depends on how you look at it his graduating class or the class that he entered with was said to be probably like the most intelligent or prolific or like really famous the most the smartest class of the 19th century so it was highly competitive um, and due to this Durkheim actually graduated second from last in his class, which didn't look good for him, but again, he got into the Grand Ecole and he was matriculating with all of these very smart people. So after he graduated, he worked in the French education system from, I believe, 1852 to 1857, I think. So he was just lecturing around at like secondary schools. He wasn't really loving it because at this time in France, they didn't really recognize sociology as like its own unique profession. It was sort of like a topic in philosophy or in economics that was related to it, but was not its own sort of thing. He didn't like this. So he went to Leipzig. Leipzig? 
that's the German city. Um, so he went there actually during the last two years of his uh, first employment to study at university where they were teaching sociology. And he was like, this is it. Like, this is the moment for me because he was like, oh, I don't have to be interested in philosophy or I don't have to be interested in like these flower ways of thinking about things because at, in this place, they were finally saying like, no, there, we need to come up with a framework to measure um, social phenomena. And this is where he started publishing a lot of work, especially in um, like G German newspapers. He was very politically active and he was corresponding with lots of um, intelligence yeah, he was really, really kicking it off with these, uh, with the Germans. So the French education system were like, no, no, you can come back now. And they hired him at a, um, the University of Bordeaux where he began lecturing. So he lectured at Bordeaux all through the 1890s. And this is where he started pumping out like tons of work. Like I think like there's at least, there's more than 10. Probably like four of his major, major works and dissertations um, were published during this time. And he was just like shooting out like all kinds of papers. And he was becoming extremely popular with his um, with his beliefs or extremely divisive because as I talked about in another video that I had done previously about the three republics, the three empires of France, it was all going on at this time. And like France at that time was a mess. Europe for that like 150 year period, I guess before he was born and like, like up to another 50 years after his death was just all, all kinds of political upheaval. Like there were regime changes all over Europe. There was uh, one war, it was leading into a second war. It was like a crazy time. So his works became very popular um, because he was very, um, he was very leftist thinker and the political spectrum kept kind of like going up and down at that time. So people loved him, he was pumping in all this work. And because of that, the University of Paris agreed to take him on as their lecturer, which was like, or their main lecturer, like the head of their education department, essentially. So he had to take this job because it was like, that was the, the natural end to his career, was probably the most prestigious position that he could get. But he would have a lifelong um, kind of like, like a bad romance with the university just because they didn't really see sociology as, um, as a bona fide thing yet, but they eventually would. Durkheim met kind of um kind of a sad end to his life. So he probably between like 1902 and 1910, um, his ideas are getting very popular, but France is also going into like a hard right direction, like super nationalist, especially leading up to World War One, uh, which I believe began in 1914. And a lot of his students were actually getting sent off to die in the war. So he didn't have a lot of contemporaries to like pick up his legacy. Eventually his own son would eventually perish in the war. Um, and this sent him into a wild depression where he became a recluse, had a stroke and died but his methods would live on much later. So he wasn't like immediately super popular afterwards, but he is a, a huge cornerstone of the modern teaching of sociology at the university level in uh, classical sociology. So now let's just look at like, what was Durkheim about? So in establishing um, a scientific method, that was the big thing that Durkheim was, was known for and why he's so important to the study of sociology, whether you agree with his theories or not, is he established frameworks to study sociology. And he did this by comparing society to a human body, which he called organic solidarity. Now there's two types of solidarity according to Durkheim. One is mechanical solidarity and two is organic solidarity. Mechanical solidarity is something that operates like a well-oiled machine hence mechanical solidarity. These would describe things like small tribal communities or like small castes, hunter-gatherer societies. There isn't really a lot of mechanical solidarity happening in the world right now, um, but these were situations where all of your roles in, in life are completely defined from birth by your age, your, your gender, your biology, by your ability, by lots of things, by who you got married to, like what time you would get married, everything, your religion, everything was kind of set in stone for you when you were born. There wasn't a lot of like, oh, I'm gonna get to decide to go do this, or I'm gonna decide to do that. No, everything was set up, mechanical solidarity. Organic solidarity, like organs, there's a lot more freedom to move around and to exist within society, both collectively as one body, but also as an individual. And he described these relationships with people through something which he called collective consciousness. And he argued that mechanical solidarity had a much stronger collective conscience than organic solidarity where it was beginning to dwindle. And this is how he would go on to study like phenomena that happen in sociology and set up empirical methods was by trying to find social illnesses. He found social illnesses to diagnose it like a body by measuring social facts. 
A social fact is something that is external to you but has some form of control over your life whether you participated in it or not. So this would be something like poverty. Poverty exists whether you're poor or not and it also affects how it affects your life whether you want it to or not. It's just something that's there. Thing like marriage, religion, etc., etc. This is also why um, Durkheim was a big fan of organized religion because in his studies he realized that it gave um, stronger collective consciousness to a society and that societies would function much better the stronger their collective consciousness was. He described it the pathology, as he would call it, the pathology of a society was based on a breaking down of the collective consciousness and by a strengthening of the individual, like um, kind of becoming like a rogue agent or something like that, like um, almost described like a, as a cancerous cell on, um, on society. He, called, he described this method using the term anime. So anime is a breakdown of the collective consciousness based on how social facts are interacting. So one example would be that he said that crime and deviance were essential to society, that you had to have at least a little bit of crime and at least a little bit of deviance to reinforce the collective consciousness. Like, what are our ideas about right and wrong? What are our ideas about punishment and justice and retribution? We need these things to exist so that we may know something. Very similar to in my other video I did about George Herbert Mead and the development of the self. He talks a lot about this as well, not using the term enemy, but the same concept of by having others in society and ideal types that makes us stronger together. A lot of these ideas that Durkheim would coin, like anime, collective consciousness, um, organic solidarity, mechanical solidarity, were discussed in his 1897, I think it was 1897, uh, dissertation on suicide. He could speak multiple languages, at least Italian, French, English, and German, and was studying the suicide rates in different countries such as Italy, Germany, France, and England and just showing that places with a stronger collective consciousness would be more or less likely to commit suicide. Some of these findings have been disputed later on as not having a strong enough or a more controlled scientific method, but still it was the first time perhaps that a, an experiment of this nature had been performed to show that sociology was in fact a um, bona fide, accurate, and um, very intelligent way to observe societal phenomena. Anyways, thank you for listening, and I hope you guys like, comment, and subscribe. Please check out our other videos, and we hope to see you again soon. Okay, bye-bye.